Good evening. Welcome to Ion Bethel. I'm Paul Zetkowski, your host for tonight's program. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in a recession. And every time we watch TV, we see the same negative news constantly. The red ink is flowing all over. We look at our representatives in Washington, you wonder, do they know what they're doing outside of the beltway? I know I've said this on a previous program. Can you imagine your boss giving you a raise for doing a bad job? Yes, that was our Senator Dodd with AIG. You know, I was in business for nearly 40 years. I never heard of my supervisor ever saying to me, Paul, you did a terrible job. You're staying on board and here's a raise. Ridiculous, isn't it? Well, fortunately, you know, here in the state of Connecticut, we have legislators who are concerned about their constituents, about what's going on up in Hartford. And myself being a selectman, I look forward to their guidance sometimes as how we're going to run the town with their assistance. With me tonight, I have with me Senator Mike McLaughlin. Mike, welcome to the program. Thank you, Paul. Glad to and, be here. You know, being a freshman senator, what an introduction under this economic crisis. And I understand that you're also minority whip at the same time, probably because of all of your background that you've had here in Danbury, working with the mayor, that you understand the system. Congratulations. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, frankly. Well, it's, uh, uh, it's an exciting challenge. You know, most people have said to me, uh, the insiders in, in Hartford have said to me, Mike, you picked a tough year to, to join the state Senate. I don't look at it that way. I look at it as a great challenge. You know, the, the, the whole situation that we're dealing with here, this fiscal crisis, this budget crisis in uh, Connecticut and around the world, uh, no one up there has had to deal with to this degree. And so I'm glad to be there. Uh, that's why I consider it an exciting opportunity. And especially with your background coming from banking, when you're dealing with millions and billions, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I'm hearing these billions number, I'm saying to myself, you know, this is getting a little frightening, but fortunately we've got somebody who understands these big numbers. You know, uh, let, let's just get into the meat of the matter here a little bit. Just recently, up in Hartford, I think perhaps we saw you on TV. This was the 1098 bill. Well, uh, and let's explain what the 1098 bill. Some of the people might might not know what this is all about, but I think uh, it might be good. Well, I'm a member of the Judiciary Committee, and right. uh, the chairs, the co-chairs of the Judiciary Committee, uh, proposed a, a bizarre uh, a bill uh, known as 1098 which basically took away from bishops and pastors of the Roman Catholic Church in Connecticut all of their authority for decision-making. Uh, basically what it was doing was infringing on First Amendment rights uh, right from the United States Constitution in the Roman Catholic Church. And so, uh, rightfully so, uh, Catholics from all over the state, but from all faiths, it wasn't just Catholics, uh, I were outraged by this. I had uh, probably 1,600 plus emails and several hundred phone calls, uh, and and they literally shut down the 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 uh, phone system at the Capitol. The email account for uh, the Judiciary Committee just overflowed, uh, and and so this outrage turned into a, a rally uh, at the state Capitol uh, last week. And and I think what happened was uh, two things. One. Uh, a clear message was sent to uh, Senator Andrew McDonald, uh, the co-chair, and Representative Michael Lawler, the co-chair of the Judiciary Committee, uh, don't tread on our First Amendment rights, number one. And number two, uh, keep your, you know, your personal uh, uh, angst against the Catholic Church at home and don't bring it into the legislature. That's not what this is about. So uh, 4,000 plus people showed up at the Capitol uh, on a Wednesday. Uh, sort of a rainy morning, and uh, it, it really was exciting, uh, as I'm a Catholic, it was exciting to see people of my faith show up, number one, but number two, it wasn't just Catholics. Right. Uh, that day was full of uh, people from the faith community and those who, who really uh, feel strongly about First Amendment rights. I got phone calls from uh, Mormons and, and uh, uh, Latter-day Saints, uh, Methodist, Episcopalians, lots of people were calling. And the last phone call I got on that issue, the night before the rally, 
uh, was from uh, a neighbor of mine who's the, the uh, rabbi of the uh, United Jewish Center in Danbury. And uh, uh, Rabbi Leibrach called to say that we too uh, encourage you and support you uh, in your opposition to this bill. Uh, national attention. Uh, this was a, uh, a real blindside and truly a bizarre attack on, on the faith community in mm -hmm. Connecticut. Uh, it's dead now. We, uh, we ultimately voted in the Judiciary Committee to uh, box the bill, which means that it's, uh, it's put away now for this legislative session, uh, and hopefully it's not going to come back again. Uh, you know, it, it was, a, in a sense, you say, it was the outrage that really made people go up there. And I, yeah. too, like you, a Catholic, but in my own neighborhood, you know, people from different faiths mm -hmm. had said the very same thing that mm -hmm. you did. You know, if it starts with us, or you know, with one church, it's going to precipitate down, and you wonder, where is it going to stop? And you wonder, uh, was it personal motivation of these two legislators, or didn't they research it? And you know, the, the bottom line is, and I've got to be objective about it, you know, no matter what you do, you've got to research things. And like you say, it, it was just an infringement upon our, no for, question our constitutional yeah, amendments no question here. About it. Well, listen, thank you for that because, you know, I, I think everybody says, well done to the legislature on this one. Let's talk about another one. It's, uh, it's uh, Senate, uh, Senate Bill 172, an act redefining the terms uh, uh, governing a constitutional spending cap. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting debate that's been going on for over 16 years. In fact, uh, in 1992, uh, the voters of Connecticut, by an 80% majority, approved a constitutional amendment uh, for, for a spending cap, which would hold the uh, legislature to uh, certain minimal increases in the budget every year. But they've never lived by it. Well, they, <laughs> they say they have. They say that they have. Unfortunately, they haven't fully implemented it as requested and required by this constitutional amendment. And so uh, I submitted a bill which will be the technical implementation uh, of the constitutional spending cap. And my theory on this is that uh, not only did the voters ask for this 16 years ago, but that this more so than ever is the appropriate time for us to fully implement the cap uh, because it, it